All right, well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. As Steve said, uh, been working on this a little bit together with Werner, and uh, I know that with all the things that have gone on in our community in Nashville and around the uh, country, uh, I've had several people that I know that are in here that have come up and have had questions and concerns. Uh, so the Frank County Sheriff's Department has been going around for several months now, I guess, uh, doing presentations to churches and other businesses that are concerned about just being aware of the situation in, uh, in the community. And tonight, uh, Sergeant Chris Guest is here with us. Uh, Warner and I had the pleasure of going to listen to him at uh, one of the other churches in the community about a month and a half ago and, uh, and asked him to come to this congregation. They've got a three-part uh, process they're doing with uh, the Sheriff's Department and this is kind of uh, the second phase of the three phases that they offer. And uh, so I'd like to uh, now turn it over to Chris, let him come talk to us, and uh, there'll be some questions and answers at the end. I'm sure that if you have any questions during it, just raise your hand and, and uh, we'll, we'll answer them as we go. Thank you. We had been doing these probably a month, and I was doing one say so a month in and a guy raised his hand and I said yes and he said what gives you the right or the certification or the knowledge to know how to do this he was talking about the presentation and at first you take that as an insult but then I really thought about it and I thought you know if somebody was trying to teach me something I'd want to know what they knew if I needed to be listening to them or not so I incorporate that now into this uh, like Parker said I am Chris Guess I think I know about everybody in here I'm with the sheriff's office. I've been in law enforcement 28 years. I'm a certified crime prevention specialist. I'm a member of our SWAT team, the entry team for our special operations unit. I'm a certified hostage negotiator. I've been to DARE school. I'm a police instructor, and I'm the training officer at the sheriff's office and the general departmental instructor there also. Hopefully that is a good enough resume to be able to have some knowledge about security, but I like for people to know that so you know we didn't just throw this together and we were actually working on this about a month before the the incident down in Sutherland Springs because I'd spoken to our chief deputy who's our tactical commander and I said this is coming and we need to be prepared and then the situation in Texas happened and the sheriff finally said quit working on it and go do it and I said yes sir because that's what you say when your boss tells you to do something if you want to hang around but anyway, so that's, that's a little bit about why we put this together. Uh, the other reason that we put this together, and we talked about this, is you're going to see advertisements, social media, maybe newspaper, magazines, wherever the case may be, and somebody's going to be standing there in full tactical uniform with 15 guns hanging off of him, and he's going to say, I can make your church secure. Sure can. Be glad to for $150 a person. Because there are people in this world that will try to make money on fear. The sheriff's office doesn't want a penny. What we want is we want our people and our community safe. That's why we tried to get out in front of this and provide this up front before the companies and the money makers came along. So that's another motivation for us doing this is to provide a service to the community. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. That's okay. There we go. We, we have already been here, I have, I guess a month, month and a half ago, and we did a security assessment of your facility. And I'm not going to lie to you, I'm going I'm to be straightforward with you. This is a hard facility. And I'm telling you things you know because there's so many entrances, exits. You have three different buildings on a city block. So it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging. But anything you do, anything you do, you make yourself safer. Anything. Graders at the door, you make your facility safer. Cameras, you make your facility safer. So you don't have to, to be the CIA or the Secret Service. You can do things to harden your target, that's the way we put it, and make yourself safer. And some things you might not even realize you do. But we've, we've been here and we've talked about that. That, that's the first part of this program. We call it phase one. 
And we know not everybody takes all our suggestions, and that's fine, but we can tell you best practices. Then you have to decide, as a church and a congregation, the leadership has to decide which way to go and, and what's best. As of November 14, 2017, for the year 2017, there were 316 mass shootings in the United States. Now, that's not all churches. It's not just all schools. It's not just all one thing. It's together. But I think we would all agree that that's way too many. And we've decided what we'll do is we'll let the politicians argue about the guns, how to handle the mental health and the background checks and all that. And we'll try to help people know how to be safe and stay alive. Now, that we can do. We don't have to ask the government for permission. So it is there. But when you start researching this and you start looking back, what you find out is it's been there for a long, long time. Maybe not to the uh, common occurrence. Unfortunately, it's become. But you can find things all the way back to in the 60s if you want to look that far. The thing is, now with social media and the way the news outlets get, get their message out so quick and so broad, everybody knows about everything. Something happened in Texas in 1968 or 1970. We might find out about it a week or two later. We might not find out about it at all. And that was way down there. And now it happens so quick and it's in your face so quick like that, it's like it's in your own backyard. Um, so that's, that's, that's why there's more, seems to be more awareness about it. And I'm not bragging on the media necessarily, but they, they get that message out so much quicker. There has already been a problem, I'll tell you, at a church here in this county. Now, it did not result in a shooting, but it could have. And it was prevented because somebody picked up the telephone and called us. And we'll get into something seems wrong, say something to somebody. We'll cover that. But you can't say or you can't have the mindset of it'll never happen here, I don't think, anymore. You know, we used to kind of have that mindset about school shootings. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If it can happen at Lincoln County High School, which it did, it can happen here. So you have to be prepared. Okay. These occurrences, these people that come into churches and do violence, I wish I could stand here and tell you that we can profile them for you. Here's what you're looking for. Can't do it because there's not a profile form. Now, I can profile a serial killer if you want me to. Down to, the, down to it, down to the finer points. But you cannot with mass shooters or active shooters, however you want to refer to them. Example being Devin Patrick Kelly was a Caucasian male prior military, and Cadega Sampson that did the shooting at Antioch was a Somalian immigrant. Now that's pretty much all over the map. Dylan Roof was a white supremacist. Larry Jean Westbrook was just a guy from Texas. I mean, there's nothing you can pinpoint that down to. So instead of trying to go that avenue and, and profile down who do you need to be looking for, that's not what you do. What you do is you look for oddities or things that don't belong. I think it's the best way to approach this. And let me say this, because I see some expressions already. Here's our end game with this. I think it's important you know that up front. Here's the sheriff's office end game. Well, here's what we want. We want whatever kind of security team or whatever kind of security you choose to implement we want to work with them, help them if we can, help them develop a plan, get them trained. I'm here tonight to show you and tell you what to do if you have a problem and you're unarmed. Then our phase three, we would come back and work on some specialty kind of things with the security people. And then we want you to relax and go back and have church. Because that's why you're here. And be relaxed and, and, and enjoy and, and do what you're here to do. I think that's, that's, everybody, that's important that you know. Because when we first posted this, and that's the way we got this message out originally on social media that we would be offering this program, I, I put it on our Facebook page, and as soon as I put that up there, I call them the comment rangers. You get the comments under your post. And about the tenth one down, this lady said, that's it, 
I'm done. Not sending my daughter to church anymore. Now, I've got two problems with that. Number one, you ought to have been going with her, not sending her. This is how it is. Number two, you just let evil win. If you refuse to leave your home, or you are nervous about going to church and you don't go, or you can't uh, relax while you're there, or you let this type of thing knock you out of the day-to-day -day life that you like to live, you let evil win and they never have to do anything. Don't do that. It's just like with terrorists. If you say, I'm, I'm never going to leave my house because I'm afraid a terrorist is going to blow me up, they win and they never pull a trigger. I think it's important that people continue to live their lives the way they want to live them and enjoy life the way you want to enjoy it. Just be prepared. Just know. So don't let, you know, you don't need to let evil win by doing nothing. And then if you continue to do the routine and live the way you want to live and you have a problem with something evil, at least you're prepared to deal with it. Then you deal with it and you go on, you go on with your life. Okay. Motives. Now, I can give you some motives. Some of the, some of the ministers get real nervous about that uh, fourth one down. Or, uh, I'm sorry, third one down. The first one is jealousy. And these are all humanistic problems. People, that, you know, people come to church. People are human beings. People have arguments. People have domestic issues. People may have child custody uh, struggles going on. Those type things. That's, that's just a fact of life, and it's human, and it's human nature. You know, uh, I, I probably fall shorter than everybody in here. I'm a human. So jealousy is one of them. Politics. And why would anybody ever argue about politics, right? And I'm sorry, Pastor, but yeah, sometimes it's sermon content. The guy that I told you had the problem with in this county... My issue was we didn't know about it and it had been going on a, a month and nobody had called us. But finally one Saturday the minister was out cleaning up around the church and the guy pulled up and said, here's the deal. I know you've been practicing witchcraft in that church. It's obviously a mental health issue. And he said, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you all. And it unnerved the minister to the point where he called us and we were able to conduct an investigation and get this guy in custody. He lived about from here to across the street from the church. So it was a very real threat. Okay, let's see. Domestic issues, obviously you can have those. You're going to have them if you, if you have anybody at all, you know, attend your church. That you're going to have those over time because that's just, that just happens. Revenge for whatever. Abuse. When you talk about abuse, you're talking about probably some kind of spousal abuse or child abuse. It is just as likely, and we tell the security people they're going to be involved directly in the security of this, it is just as likely in a church in Franklin County, any given Sunday morning, that a man and a wife or girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it is, has an argument Saturday night or early Sunday morning, and he doesn't want to go, her to go to church, and she says, well, I'm going anyway, and she comes in here and sits down. And five minutes after the service starts, he walks in and grabs her by the hair of the head and tries to jerk her out of here. That is just as likely as someone with a gun. So you also have to be prepared to deal with that, because you can't let that go on. And we talk to the security people about that. That gets to be more of a hands-on kind of thing. Parking. Now, I don't know who got into it about parking, but they must have really needed something to argue about pretty bad. <laughs> I don't, let me tell you something. I've been working at the sheriff's office about a month. And I whipped in one morning, and I parked in the first spot right here by the mailbox. And I'm out, and I've been there about a month, and I'm really going at it. Well, I had gone into the administrative office. I'd actually been there about a year. And I was working in the admin office, and I was in there popping away and working and getting all this put together. And the secretary at that time came in and let me know in no uncertain terms. I was in her parking spot, and I better move. So what did I do? I got up and went outside and got in my car and moved it. You don't want to make the secretary mad. You don't mess with people that keep up with your money and your food. The military taught me that. 
Race is an issue. As in the case of Dylan Roof in South Carolina. I'm unfortunate, and it's sad to have to say, we hadn't come quite that far. Our SWAT team went to Shelbyville about three months ago and worked that rally they had over there for the White Lives Matter. And my, oh my. And it just wasn't one-sided either. They had a group on the other side. They did it in a... It was really loved the way they did this. They put the White Lives Matter people over here, and they put Antifa over here, and they took us and put us right in the middle. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. But the disturbing thing, the most disturbing thing that happened that day was they were breaking down and getting ready to leave, and we were standing there, and one of those guys, he might have even had the Nazi memorabilia, I don't know, something like that. He was... You could tell. And he screamed over it on the other side of the road. Dylan Roof didn't do anything wrong. And I thought, boy, there's a special place for you. Because, yeah, he did. And mental illness. And that's, one of the, that's probably the hottest topic going today because of the school shootings. And I don't know what to tell you. That's going to have to be a legislative thing. We're going to have to do something more to help people in this country with mental illnesses. Just one man's opinion, though. We're all going, also going to have to attach that to the ability to buy a farm. I don't know why you would. But anyway, those are motives, okay. Those are just uh, a few uh, incidences. The one that I use as a teaching point is the middle one. Because what you'll hear me say later on, and you'll hear me say it several times, is these people that do these kinds of things do not like to be confronted, and they do not like resistance. They want everybody to cow down and just be a target. In this case, Larry Gene Ashbrook, what he did is walked in a church in Texas with a 9mm pistol and started shooting. A 19-year-old kid on the back row stood up and said, you don't need to do this, which I thought was pretty gutsy for anybody, much less a 19-year-old kid. Ashbrook curses him real bad and tells him to sit down. The kid sits down and he goes up and stands over him and said, you need Jesus, implying you're next. And the kid looked up at him and said, you know, man, I've got Jesus. You're the one that needs Jesus. So he goes over and sits down on the pew beside him and shoots himself. And the, the criminal psychiatrist that profiled that case said the reason that that happened was because he was not prepared for somebody to resist him or challenge what he was doing. And in any of these cases, you'll find that the guy in Sutherland Springs walks in, does what he does, and when he leaves, goes outside and is confronted by a neighbor, what does he do? He throws his gun down, jumps in his truck, and runs off. They're not expecting resistance, and we'll get into that all, some too. Okay? Those are some more Dylan Roof, you see. And I use the Dylan Roof incident when I'm talking about cameras because the cameras are only as good as the people watching them. In the video, you can see him pull up in his car. Do not watch the video, please. But you can see him pull up in his car, and they have a camera right above the either of their door. He walks up, looks this way. He looks this way, reaches to get the door, and you see the gun sticking out of his pants but nobody's watching the camera. So your equipment is only as good as your people operating it. I think that's important to, to remember. Okay. Those are just some pictures of, of uh, shooters, active shooters. Next. And you can see that it's all, over the, it's all over the map as far as profiling. You cannot profile them. Okay. And that's Devin Patrick Kelly, that was the Sutherland Springs. Okay. Now, how to improve your site security? I told you earlier that any little thing you can do, you improve the security of your facility. It may not be one major thing. It might be five medium things. Anything you do. Door, doors, windows, lighting, key control. Key control is everybody's favorite. You couldn't get me to do key control for a church if you paid me $100,000 a year because you're going to lose friends. And everybody's laughing because they know I'm right. 
Found that out the hard way one time. Seven foot, two foot rule, that's a crime prevention thing mostly for people's homes. That does not apply as much to churches because a lot of churches have windows like you do. And that's a, the seven foot, two foot is for a visual thing. Property identification is important. Even if you have equipment here or things here that do not have serial numbers, take pictures of them and put them in a lockbox or a safe somewhere. Things that do have serial numbers, take a picture of them, write the serial number down, put them in a, in a safe. Because if we go in somewhere on a search warrant and we find something that doesn't belong, like if we find a uh, piano like that in a crack house, it probably, it probably doesn't belong there. It's stolen. But we have to have some way to match that up. And that's good to do. That's good to do in your own home, much less here. So be sure that, that that's taken care of. Okay, next. Those are scenarios. And we're not just talking about uh, gun incidences or active shooter incidences. There are other things that your security people can be responsible for. People have heart attacks. People have strokes. People faint. People have panic attacks. I mean, people have health issues. And that's something else. If you have somebody with some medical training, that would be good maybe to have them part of your security staff. They might not be figured in into the reaction to an active shooter, but they can be figured in if you need to use a defibrillator. You know, things happen. How many fire drills you ever practiced? I'm batting 999. There's one church in this entire county has practiced one fire drill. Is there any children in here? No. Here's why I say that, though. It's good to do a fire drill, obviously, but you've got to have an evacuation plan, and you need to practice it. Let's say you're having an upward basketball, Mr. Gallagher, and you need to evacuate. You do not want to tell your children, we're going to practice this in case the bad man comes to church with a gun to shoot it up. You don't want to do that. Now you scared your children. But what you can tell them is we're going to practice our fire drill. They do that at school about once a quarter. That's no big deal to do that. So a lot of it's how you word things. That's why that's important. You know, somebody pulls up in this parking lot on Sunday and says, it's my day to have the kids and I'm taking them. And she says, no, you're not. What do you do? Those are things you need to, you need to consider. Okay. You have, in your planning, what you will see or what you will find out if you look into this, most of this is planning. Most of, most of it is, is planning. Have a plan. And there, there are templates you can download for action plans. Uh, anybody here ever been in the military? Some of them are like operation plans. So it just ha you've got to have a plan. Now, what you have to have, you have to have a plan prior or pre-incident, and things like that would be the development of a security team, how you're going to evacuate, those type things. During the incident, and we're going to get into that in just a second, how you react during the incident, and then post-incident. Because if you do have a problem in here, you do have an incident, you're going to want to leave the facility at some point. Where are you going to go? When you get there, how are you going to account for all your people? And that's the hardest part of it all. Because we make people sign in and out at school. We don't make them sign in and out at church. I don't think that's what we're after. Who is going to make contact with the medical personnel, the first responders, if you have somebody injured? You see, it's, it's planning. And the one thing a lot of people don't think about is this. If you do have an incident, hopefully we never do. But if you do, and you evacuate, I promise you, as I'm standing here today, channel 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, will all come here. And they'll come right over to where you are, and they'll stick a microphone in the first person's face they can find and say, well, what happened? How do you feel? Now, if you have somebody that can handle that kind of thing and is comfortable handling that kind of thing, that's who, you know, you need to, people need to know, send them to... This person. You need to speak to this person. If you don't have somebody comfortable doing that, call us and I'll come and do it. 
I've dealt with those wonderful people many times. That's up to you, however you choose to do it. But just know that that will happen. And they do not care what they ask. We had a deputy sheriff shot and killed about eight years ago, and I'm doing an interview in the lobby of the jail, and this cat from Channel 4 said, you know, roll tape. And when I started rolling the tape, he said, how does it feel to have one of your own shot and killed? I said, cut the tape off. They cut the tape off, and I explained a few things to him. They, they have no mercy about what they'll ask you. Just, just know that. Okay. <clears throat> General awareness. And here's the way I explain that to people. is When you leave your house, you need to be in what I call a low state of ready. And when I say that, and every time I say that, I see people's face, and they think that I'm talking about Rambo with his knife in his teeth coming out going, who am I going to get? today. No, that's not what that means. It means be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of who's around you. Just be aware of what's going on. Be aware if something doesn't look right. Be aware if something doesn't feel right. You know, that car's never been parked there before. I wonder who that is. Just be aware. And that doesn't just apply for here. That applies anywhere you go and anything you do. Walmart you think you might go over to Walmart someday and there'd be a few people there? It's actually one of my favorite places to go and just watch. But anyway, your leadership, your ushers, your children's ministry staff, and I assume you have one. The people dealing with your children are critical because that's your greatest treasure, and that's what you want to protect more than anything else. That's, that's my opinion. You've got to have your best, tightest security around your kids. That does not just count for Sunday. That counts for trunk or treat. That counts for vacation Bible school. Anytime you have a, a, a happening, anytime you have an event, it counts. Who can play critical roles? You know better than me. So talk about it. Okay. The average time of an active shooting in relation to police arrival is seven to eight minutes. It will be quicker than that here because you're right in the middle of town. That's an advantage. I would say here your average police response time will probably be between one and two and a half minutes. There will be somebody close. But even at that, a minute and a half is a long time. So you have to know how to take care of yourself a little bit. And I see people look when I say that. When I say you have to know how to defend yourself, you have to know how to take up for yourself, and people will go, hmm. Or I hear things like, Lord, take care of me. And I understand that. But when they say that to me, here's what I say back to them. I say, you know, Joe had to get up on the roof of his house one time because it was raining and the water was getting high. And a boat came by and said, hey, Joe, jump in. I'll take you out of here. Joe said, mm-mm, Lord, take care of me. Then he had to get up on his chimney, and a boat came by. And the boat said, hey, Joe, jump in. We'll take you out of here. Joe said, mm-mm, Lord, take care of me. Well, finally, old Joe had to climb up in a tree. And the helicopter came by and flipped the rope ladder down and said, hey, Joe, climb up. We'll fly you out of here. He said, no, Lord, take care of me. Well, Joe drowns what Joe did. And he got up to heaven. He asked the Lord. He said, Lord, I thought you were going to take care of me. And the Lord said, Joe, I sent you two boats in a helicopter. Help yourself. Help yourself. Don't just be a sheep to one of these evil people that come in your facility and want to try to harm you and everybody else. Don't do that. And we'll get into that a little more too. The philosophy has changed somewhat too. And now, now we're getting into if you have a problem. If somebody gets into your facility and you have a problem. If it is safe to do so, and you can get out. For years and years and years, the philosophy was lock down, turn the lights off, hide under something. Not anymore. If you can get out, get out. Now, it may be the case that that's not the safest thing to do. I understand that. I, I get that too. But if it is, then get out. Because the safest place away from somebody with a gun 
is as far away as you can get and put something between you and them. A building, a car, two buildings, get out. Okay, go, go on to the next one. I don't want to get into the Alice stuff just yet. Those are all things to consider if you have an incident. The distance from the staff and congregation and the children, that is, that is tantamount to what I was talking about with the evacuation. If you're having Sunday school down here in a Sunday school room in that big long hallway where the gym is, and somebody comes in this door, get, it's all situational. That would be a time you would want to exit the facility just as fast as you could. If he comes in that door down there, everybody comes in to do upper basketball, you're going to lock the door and try to buy yourself some time. So it's all situational. Okay. And call 911. Okay, that fits in with alert. This is the Alice training. I'm a certified Alice instructor. I went about four years ago and, and got certified in that. Alice training is the run, hide, fight mentality. They have different programs for it. The THP teaches a version of it called CRASS. Anyway, ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Alert, number one. If you have an incident, call 911. I didn't say if you have an incident, you call 911. Or if you have an incident, you just assume you're going to call 911. You don't do that. Because what will happen? If you go by that philosophy, something will happen to him, he won't be able to call 911. Then nobody's calling. Everybody call. We don't care if we get 100. We know we have a problem. When just the police knows they have a problem. Everybody calls. I'm going to bet somebody in here has got a cell phone. Right now. About $100 right now. That's what I thought. So alert. And not only that, but you alert each other. Now, how you do that's up to you. There's a lot of different ways. I like radios, handheld radios, because they're quick. You can buy walkie-talkies at Walmart that would suffice for this facility and, and your, your whole thing here. I don't know. They're about 20 25 bucks a piece. You don't have to break the bank doing that. And it's a lot quicker to be able to go click, we have a problem, so-and-so, than it is to try to call on the cell phone, try to text. Uh, some people use lights. They'll have a thing up on the wall of green, red, and yellow. And that's okay. That's fairly quick. But the, I like the walkies because you can tell people what's going on. Because if you have a problem here during Sunday school, that's a real problem. And you need to be able to communicate with each other. Alert each other to what's going on. Inform. I'm sorry. Lockdown. If you, if you know you have a problem in the parking lot, that's why ushers are important. Door graders are important. If you see that you have a problem in the parking lot, security people need to try to handle it in the parking lot. And then somebody can step up there and just simply lock the door. Now, locking all the doors in this place, you're going to need about 35 people. Y'all have a lot of entrances and exits, but you do, what, do what you have to do. That would be an incident where it would be advisable to lock down and stay in here because rule number one of all this, and we tell the security folks this, rule number one, keep it in the parking lot if you can because it minimizes tragedy. Does that make sense to everybody? I can't do as much in the parking lot, and if I get through that door and I breach this sanctuary, I do a lot of damage. That's why you need to try to keep it out there. Inform. We get about 1,000 phone calls at dispatch a day. Somebody will call and they will say, there's a vehicle in my subdivision and I know it doesn't belong here. And I understand. You live there. You know who's supposed to be there. You know. That's how it is. And we will say, or the dispatchers will say, well, what kind of car is it? I don't know. Was it a truck or a car? I don't know. What color was it? I don't know. Get down to the, did it have four tires? Maybe. So we send one of our guys out to a subdivision looking for a vehicle. Odds are not too good. And I couldn't tell you a Camry from an Altima from here to the road out here. I'm not a car guy. 
But I could tell you if it was a car or a truck. And I could tell you if it was blue or green. I could tell you if it had tinted windows. I say that to say this. If you have a problem and you are able to get on your cell phone and stay on it with the dispatcher safely, don't make yourself a target to do that. But try to be safe. If you can get somewhere and lock a door where they can't get to you and you see what's going on, one of those kind of things, there are things that we need to know that would be really helpful to us. Were there more than, was there more than one bad guy? One, two. What's he wearing? That's a biggie. Hat, no hat, shirt, coat, what's he got on? And you don't have to be a, a expert to get between 5, 8, 6, 1. That, that's okay, that range. You ought to be able to get within 50 pounds of their weight. Those type of things, and the most important thing is the last place you saw him. Because the last place you saw him is the first place we're going. So just, just know that. Roll that over in your mind. You know, if I ever did have to call, these are things they're going to ask and want to know. If you can't do that without making yourself a target, don't do it. We'll handle it when we get here. These things are just, they're, they're good information. Okay. Counter. This is where it gets a little bit, I guess, more real. If somebody does come in your facility, and they, they get to your door back here. The best vi visual of what's going on is right up here. Now, we, we discourage ministers from being part of the security team because they need to be preaching. And y'all can let, you know, y'all need to be listening. They need to be on their A game. You need to be getting what you need. So we discourage that, but if somebody comes in and, and breaks that door to this sanctuary right here, who's going to be the first person to see it? Absolutely. And he needs to be able to give the signal to tell everybody to get down. That's the first thing you do. If you can't get all the way in the floor, lay over in the pew. And we use a real complicated signal to do that. It's get down. That's about as simple as I could come up with. If you don't know what that means... Ask somebody. Get down. That does a couple of things. It gives you some protection, and it clears a path for your security team to be able to do what they're supposed to do and been trained to do. Okay? It also does something else. Let's say you're singing the opening hymn, and I come through that door, and I stick a gun up and shoot into the ceiling. It's going to take you between three to five seconds for that to register what just happened. I promise you it will. You'll go, was that what I thought it was? And that person yelling will kind of jar you back to reality. You know, if I yelled or screamed right now real quick, you'd, you'd do that. I'm not going to, so relax. But it would. So that's, there's, there's a, two reasons for doing that. That happens, and let's say this guy's just that good. Let's say he defeats your security. What do you do? I'm asking you, what do you do? I can tell you what they, I'm sorry. Call 911, absolutely. I tell you what they did in Sutherland Springs. Now you have to keep in mind, they did not have security. But when that started, they just all laid over and just sat there. Here's what you do, is you fight. And you fight as hard as you can. And people look at me and they tell me and they say, if I do that, I'm going to get shot. And I'll tell them, I can guarantee you one thing, if you don't fight, you will. What did I tell you earlier? These people do not like what? They don't like, they don't like confrontation and they don't like to be challenged. And let me ask this. How many people in here have ever tried to shoot a, a gun with somebody throwing rocks at them? It's not as easy as it looks. So what if five, six, seven, eight, ten people turn around and throw a book at this guy? You might get lucky. You might addle him enough that two or three of the men can get him down on the ground and get control of what's going on. That's better than just sitting there waiting on it because these people that come in to do this, there's no talking them down. 
They're here for one specific reason. And they have no end game. They have no getaway plan. They know this is it. So you got to turn around. Now, you, got to, you have to remember, this is if the security team's been defeated. Or if you're somewhere else and, and this happens and there is no security. So this doesn't just apply to here. You fight, and you fight as hard as you can. For as long as you can. What you're doing, number one, you're protecting your life. Number two, you're trying to buy time for the boys in blue to get here. And you're interrupting what we call the OODA loop. The OODA loop stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. Observe, orient, decide, and act. That means orient, observe. I may have that backwards, but anyway. If I come into this room, I have to orient myself to this room. And you do it, and you don't even realize you're doing it. Come in, pews here, pews there, people here. I observe, I decide, and then I act. Anywhere in that process, if something happens to interrupt me, I have to start all over. And what are you doing if you make me start over? You're buying time. Absolutely. And like I said, maybe you get lucky and hit him inside of the head and addle him and get him down. If you get him down, whoop him a little till we get here. I don't say that to be funny. When I say get control, I mean get control. But you interrupt the OODA loop and you buy time. You use whatever you have. A hymnal, your keys, your purse, a shoe. I don't care what it is. Use whatever you have to defend yourself. That is if your security team is down or has been defeated. Because really, that's about the only other choice you have. I knew I'd do that at least once. The other thing about this is this, and I always try to bring this up. There are people that come to church armed. And I'm not necessarily saying here, but across this county, I promise you people come to church armed. If you do that, it's your Second Amendment right to be armed, and I'm a Second Amendment guy, but know this. There is a plan. There's a security team being developed and a plan being put into place. And if something happens and you're not part of that team, do not become part of the problem. Does that make sense to everybody? Do not become part of the problem. There will be people, hopefully, strategically placed in the best place as possible, and they know what to do. Don't just interject yourself in, because that can go very, very bad, very, very quickly. Any questions? Must have done good. No questions. You sure? Yes. That's up to y'all. That's up to the church. That's the now when I come I'm sorry. Pardon? Once again, that's up to y'all. I say it's up to the security committee through the pastor, through the session. Do y'all have a session? Elders. I know that's the way most places do it, but that, that's up to the leadership of the church. And that's that's the first question we always ask when we come to do the first part. Is what's your stance about being armed in church? Because depending on that answer, it kind of shifts the way we have to do our program. Yes. Yes. That's, like I said, that's really something y'all have to decide. So, sure. Sure. Sure, that's not something we, you know, we understand 
We get, we get into those kind of things. You know, the, one of the first things we got into pretty deep, and it was an accident, whether or not to lock the front door. And I told our chief deputy, I said, you better be careful. And one of the first places we went, he said, I suggest locking the front door. And the preacher said, nope. And I understand that. I really do. So some of that is totally up to you. I mean, it's, we just can give you best practices. It's what we try to do. Question, yes. Right. That's a good idea. I tell you something else you can do with those. If you have, the, and I don't know, I can't remember. If you have the doors with a hydraulic thing up at the top, you can take a rubber hook like you lash things down on a trailer with. And you can wrap that around that arm and then bring it down and hook it on the inside of the door. And you can't open it from the outside. So there are things like that you can do. The push bars on the inside of the doors where you can get out and people can't get in because you can't block egress, the fire marshal will have a fit. So it's things like that. You know, a lot of that can be taken care of just, just evaluating your facility. Yes. I'm sorry. Well, the, the thing I would think of is a Sunday school teacher stepping out, and little Johnny dead bolting her out would be my first. <laughs> I used to teach school. I'm sorry. That just comes to mind. By the way, that's good training. Teaching high school is good training to be in law enforcement. Found that out. <laughs> but yet, you have, to, you have to evaluate the pros and cons of anything you do and try to make as an informed a decision as you can and what's, what's best and what's safest. Then what meets code? I mean, it's, there's a lot to think about. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. I could, I could once I saw it in his pants. What what he's talking about? What 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 Jim's talking about there goes back to what I was saying about being in a low state of ready and observing what's going on around you. It's the, it's the same thing I tell people about neighborhood watch. I can come out and talk to you about neighborhood watch. I can show you how to set up neighborhood watch. I can tell you how to do neighborhood watch, and it'll be just as good as you want it to be. You know, if you want to go somewhere and get some advanced training for security purposes. We recommend that. We cannot do it uh, because of some legal reasons. If Which I can interject could. just for a minute. Absolutely. We've got just a few minutes before our next meeting. Uh, but a lot of the questions in here have been brought up. Originally, uh, several of us were asked about 
almost two years ago to go to a program that was brought into this county uh, and I think that, that time over 50 churches uh, attended that and we had six or seven from this church that attended that also and that started part of our first process uh, if from that time we did simple things and Ms. Pat's one that headed us got several of us to go to this but we did some simple things initially uh, is that if you notice all of our push doors have plastic caps on them so you can easily remove that you don't have to go find the key anymore you can go quickly flip them up uh, Jason every Sunday once Sunday school is over and the main sanctuary is where our concern is people come through and lock up everything except for these doors back here so we're keeping people from walking in the back of the church. So there are certain things that have been going on quietly over the last couple of years that congregation really hasn't been aware of. Um, you know, we've talked with Jeff. There's a bunch of stuff that he's getting ready to talk about here in a few minutes, I'm sure, with the work that's getting ready to go on in the church over the next several months to a year. And so we've been in touch with Jeff and that committee to think about some of the other things that Chris has brought up. And uh, so there are a lot of things that have been going on in the plate. And, uh, you know, we welcome input. Uh, Warner and I have been quietly doing things on the side. Uh, as Chris said, we want to really step up tonight because I know that there are people that are in this church that are concealed carry people. Um, and just as Chris said, we don't want to create the wild, wild west out here. If you feel so compelled, I want you to tell Steve so that he can inform us and then we would like to know because the last thing that we want as you heard Chris say is to be taking care of a situation and next and we hear gunfire from behind us and it may be friendly fire but we don't know that okay if something happens and we're taking care of a situation the last thing we want is for somebody to step up from behind and have friendly fire, which distracts us, distracts other people, and could create a situation that gets way out of hand. So please, don't, as you heard Chris say, do not become an issue or problem. You know, we are working on things. Uh, if you would like to have input, we're willing to have input. And I know that we're not going to please everybody. But we're going to try to do what the best is for the church and based on what what our conference suggests uh, we are all here and this you know we asked Chris to come and this is something not only for this church but as he also said if you're at Walmart if you're at Huddle House if you're at the post office this is just a situational awareness of your surroundings so uh, you know please Try not to get overboard. I know there's been several people in this church that I've heard go, oh, you know, everybody should be armed. Well, no, and you're hearing that also with the schools right now, you know. They are, the law enforcement is coming out and saying, no, we don't want a bunch of teachers out there armed. And so, please, yes. Yes, we will let the congregation know what's going to happen and where we're going. Like I said, this is a, a multi-phase process. We're about halfway through it. There is a lot that we are taking care of. And as Chris said, you know, we're worried about Mother's Day out. We're worried about the Boy Scouts. We're worried about having, you know, something happen and somebody walks up to the nursery. You know, there, that's why there are certain things already in play with bells and ringing and things and the doors being secured. So, yes, Tommy. The question is, do we know how many people have concealed? Uh, there, have, there are more than you think. And, no, we don't. <laughs> We definitely don't want you carrying, Tommy. <laughs> we want you to take your, your cane and beat him. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Because I know we've run out of time and we need to get on to another one.
right. going to go ahead and finish up. I appreciate you guys having me. And those type of conversations, not only are they necessary, they're extremely important because the second church I went to, I asked the minister, I said, how many people do you have on Sunday morning? He said, about 200. I said, how many are armed? He said, about 40. I said, we need to have a talk to prevent what some of you are scared of, you know, it's to prevent that, and they did, and we got a hold of it and made it better. If you have any questions that I can help you with, please feel free to contact me at the sheriff's office. We have a Facebook page. If you want to message, send me a message there. My phone number is on the Internet to show you how smart I am. I'm easy to get a hold of, but if you have a, a concern or a question or if the security team needs or, or wants anything from us, we would be more than glad to come back anytime and help any way we can. Like I said before, that's what we want. We want you to have everything that you can possibly have to make yourself safe and secure and, and keep on having church in a relaxed manner. And, and uh, like I said, we're willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Okay? Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. I'll just say one more thing. You will hear from us as we're progressing and moving through with different organizational plans. So uh, Steve will just announce uh, when we have a next meeting of, for the congregation to, to discuss what we have. So I guess I'll turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, sorry we ran into your time. Shoot the laser from there. You go shoot the laser from there. Just, just don't put it on my forehead. Well, good evening. That was uh, quite informative. I thought very, <clears throat> very appropriate for the um, for the world in which we live in today. I don't multitask very well, so give me just a minute. <clears throat> okay, I've got just a couple small presentations to make. The first one, oh, okay. Oh, well, I can use this handheld. I'm going to use the handheld, Janet. She's back there. I know she is. Can you hear me now, Janet? Can you turn this handheld up just a little bit? This is orange. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Can everybody hear me well? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks for coming out tonight. As I said, I think that was uh, very informative uh, for the world and the environment in which we live in today. And hopefully everybody got a lot of nuggets that they can take away from that. And uh, <clears throat> hope also that you got some security and uh, maybe that helped too. Um, dispel some of your fears that you may have. So, thanks again to the committee that put that together. Um, so, what I want to talk about for just a few minutes is the facility renewal plan update, and then I have another topic I'd like to discuss with you after that. So, I'll kind of break it down, um, and then I'll stop after each section. And if you have questions about that section, it'd probably be better if I just answer them at that time. Um, so everybody, is, everybody, is everybody aware of the facility renewal plan? Yes? Okay. So um, <clears throat> it really started at the first of the year, and we began 
uh, kind of uh, getting everything together, getting color choices made. Uh, there's de design decisions that had to be made. We had to get our project manager on board, uh, get our subcontractors lined up. We had uh, materials that have to be ordered. There's lead times on that. So I'm just going to kind of break it down about what's going on now. And uh, <clears throat> then I'll stop again after each section and you can ask questions about that section. So the first thing I want to talk about is the restrooms that are being renovated that are on the first floor here. Um, now that wasn't really part of the facility renewal plan. However, the, the uh, finance committee uh, gave the trustees a pot of money to renovate these bathrooms and they haven't been renovated in a long time and they're very old and very tired. So uh, we're, embarking, we're embarking upon that. We've been working with an interior design group to finalize finishes and, and decor in both of those rooms. Uh, currently, materials are on order. It'll be starting in the next couple of weeks. And the order that we're going to do it in is we are going to shut down the men's room first <clears throat> and renovate that one. When we do that, guys, we're going to have to trek up to another restroom. But that's being southern gentlemen we're going to do that to allow the ladies to still have their restroom in use uh, and then once we finish that one then we're going to shut the ladies down and we're going to put a temporary sign on the men's and let the ladies go to that one and we're going to keep on track into another one until we get that one done so we're going to take one for the team guys uh, but when we get when we get those done they'll 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 be very nice uh, we're going to upgrade uh, <clears throat> We're going to upgrade those. They're going to be very modern, very nice. We're going to have exhaust fans in them. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, most of the work will be contained to the restrooms themselves. The doors that come out into the hallway, those have to be widened. These have to be uh, handicapped accessible, so to meet ADA standards, we're going to have to widen those doors. Now, I hear you. I know you're saying, well, you can't get up there if you're uh, disabled anyways because there's no way. Well, the trustees are working on that, so we're trying to find a way to make that happen in the very near future. We've been uh, batting that issue around now for quite a few months. Pat's been instrumental in getting us some information on that, so hopefully in the very near future we will have that access to those restrooms. Uh, <clears throat> and then the restrooms obviously need to be handicap accessible when that time happens. So, are there any questions on the restrooms? No? Uh, I do want to let Lisa know that as we're working inside here, <clears throat> we will, I'm going to meet with you, with our subcontractors, and it will be the same guys that are working each time. So I'm going to meet with you, uh, and I'm going to introduce you to all these folks, just so that you'll know uh, who's in the building, who's supposed to be here, who's not supposed to be here. I want you to feel comfortable with that. Also, uh, I know you have a nap time for your kids. And my, con yeah. <laughs> my contractors have agreed to kind of uh, schedule their lunch around the nap time. Now, that's when, but like we're working in the bathrooms and we're doing a lot of noise. It's really going to upset everybody. We can't, I mean, it's really going to interrupt their, the kids' nap period. We, we obviously won't be able to stop all the noise because we've got a lot of work that's going to be going on with the windows uh, and the roof and all that. But we're going to try to minimize that so that your program uh, has the least amount of interruptions as possible. So we'll let you know that. Any questions about that? Okay. And i got to enter my password in. I'm not really sure why I locked this thing. There's nothing in here that anybody would be interested in or that I don't care to lose. Okay, I want to talk about the windows. Um, the windows in the education building are being replaced. So those windows uh, have been ordered and we're currently in the, in, in the queue um, to have those made. They'll be arriving shortly uh, and the work will likely commence this month sometime. Now that will be woven in with the renovation of the restrooms. As you know, there's some windows in the restrooms have to be replaced. Oh, which by the way will be uh, frosted glass in the restrooms. 
for those of you. I know you didn't ask that question, but I, I know somebody had it. Um, so we'll, they'll probably be doing both jobs at the same time, but the restrooms will, will take priority over that. Now, when the windows arrive, what we're going to do is put the windows in all the classrooms and rooms where, where they go. Uh, now, we'll make special accommodations for the preschool section. Uh, but we'll find an out-of-the-way corner and put those in your room. And uh, if you'll just be sensitive to that, we'll do our best to keep them, keep them out of your way. They won't really take up that much room. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to work hard. Uh, we're going to work hard in the rooms to cover any of your materials and of your Sunday school materials that you have. We're going to cover that up, and we're going to clean as we go. And then when we move from room to room, then Joseph's going to help us out by doing some some uh, general cleaning as well. So I, I feel comfortable we're going to do a really good job at that. You know, there there will be mishaps. If there's any, if there's any mishaps along the way, please feel free to contact me, and I will address whatever situation arises. So I don't want anyone to feel that they can't contact me. And if you don't have my information, they have it over at the church office. So I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. Um, as we replace the windows, we get the new windows in, we'll be doing painting, uh, some plastering, and touch up. And we'll, what we'll probably do is put a base coat on. But you'll more than likely notice that they will not be painted back the same color as your room, all the, all the touch ups we do, because we're going to save that. And it makes sense to save that until the painting project happens in a few months. So if you'll just be patient and bear with us, uh, we'll get that taken care of in its proper time. Any questions about the windows? No, ma'am. Yeah, no, we haven't talked about bulletproof glass. I'm just, not, I'm not sure that we need that level of security here. Um, again, the security team is, has been uh, digesting all of our security needs for this facility. And as they present them to me, then we develop a plan to try to put those into place. Uh, I think the situation that you're uh, mentioning as far as the two-way glass, that can be remedied with some good blinds. Uh, that Lisa can close at any time if she deems necessary. Okay. Okay. So that should take care of that portion. Um, was you just was your question just pertaining to exterior windows only? So the glass that's on the outside is made to protect the window, uh, to keep water out uh, from getting into the leaded portion, and actually to protect the stained glass. It's 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 not bulletproof. Uh, I just, first of all, I I personally don't think we're there yet to where we have to put in bulletproof glass. Secondly, it would be extremely expensive to actually do that, and we just. We don't have the budget for that at this point, so I'm just not sure that it makes sense to, to do that at this point. Uh, however, again, you can present that to the security folks, and they'll be more than happy to con consider that and weigh out, weigh out that option. And it would be unfortunate if any of our windows got destroyed, but I think in the event of an active shooter, I, I think the windows are going to be <clears throat> the, very least of our, the very least of our concerns. 
Um, you know, there's, you can, you have to plan for scenarios that you think are real and are going to happen. There's just certain things. You can't plan for everything or you would just live in a fortress. And unfortunately, we don't, we're just, we're not, at this point, we're, we're not going to be able to go to that level. But thank you for the question. I think it's a very, well, I think it's a very valid concern. But I think we can meet the immediate needs. Um, she's got the blinds. I think most of the classrooms on the first floor, well, correct me if I'm wrong, do most of the classrooms on the first floor have blinds? Yes. Okay. Yes, there are restrooms on the on the uh, next floor. Yeah, some people some people will have a hard time getting up the steps. So so I think then in that case using the gym restrooms would be better. It's a long trek over there, I know, and it's going to be inconvenient. Uh, and I apologize in advance for the inconvenience, but it's, it's really one that can't be avoided. No, I don't. No, it shouldn't take that long. I'm guessing a, I'm guessing a couple weeks per restroom maybe. But see that if but if we spend two weeks per restroom, and we might not spend that long, but if we do, that's four weeks without a restroom for the guys. So, new rule: you can't drink coffee or water on Sunday mornings till after church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Okay. So, if anybody feels. Uh, if anybody feels uh, that they're in an insecure environment on the first floor and they feel like they need some blinds, uh, please get with one of the trustees and we'll be glad to talk to you about, about that. Blinds are really inexpensive. Uh, the problem with blinds, one reason we resist putting up blinds is because nobody cleans blinds. They never get clean. Uh, so they start looking bad after a while, but there's a difference between aesthetics and security. So we want everyone to feel secure, as secure as they can in their classrooms. Any more questions about the windows? Okay, great. I'll move on to the next topic, roofing. Um, so currently, well, I guess everyone knows that we are roofing the entire facility, all three building so the entire campus uh, entire campus gets roofed uh, currently the roofing colors are being the roofing colors and materials are being finalized uh, and the materials will, will be on site very soon we have a commitment from our roofer to start about mid-march uh, sometimes roofers don't always start when they're supposed to but that's okay uh, but we do need to get him on site and get him started uh, we've chosen a, a, a high quality contractor, but he's a smaller contractor, so that project will take a little longer than a very large company could come in here and do it in, but we're really going to get a high quality job. Uh, uh, we're going to start here at the sanctuary is where we're going to start, and then we'll just move backwards through the education building and the Barrett building on that. Uh, we'll try, when we bring materials to site we will barricade those off just to let people know that they're there uh, so I'm, I'm sure parents will you know make sure their children aren't playing on top of the materials and and everybody just just use uh, good common sense and, and and be aware of where those are at the roofers will be cleaning up as they go uh, so there's not going to be a big mess in the yard uh, there's not going to be a big pile of shingles so that will be taken care of as we go. Uh, any areas where they're roofing and it's unsafe, where roofing materials could actually fall off and hurt somebody, uh, we will barricade those areas off <clears throat> as we go. When I say barricade, it's probably just going to be boundary tape, like the yellow police tape that you've seen. It'll probably be that 
Um, but there may there may be times when more formal barricading is needed. So we may have some big we may have cones or orange barrels or something like that if you don't need to park in that area. Um, but that should all be highly visible. Again, if anyone has any concerns about that throughout the process, please get with one of the trustees. And I would be the best person to contact on that because I'm in direct communication with our project manager and our project manager directly controls um, the contractor. So, but any trustee, if there's a situation where our contractors need to stop and stand down for a while, we can make that happen. Uh, now we are aware that there are events going on in the facility. Uh, I'm working with, uh, with uh, Melissa and the administrators in the office. Uh, we're keeping our eye on that calendar and we'll make sure when we need quiet times or when events are going on that we're not pulling off a roof while a big major event's going on there. So we'll be scheduling around all those events. Uh, I don't anticipate any problems with that at all because we're right on top of it. So it should, it should go well. Any questions about the roofing? Yes. It is. So the company that we're buying the materials from has a, has a branch in Manchester. They have about four different branches around the Mid-South. So we won't get all the materials on site all at one time. We'll only be getting the materials that we can use in the next few weeks. So there won't be a large pile in any particular place. And we'll choose the place that, that we think is the most convenient, first of all, that our roofers can get to. They gotta be able to get to their materials um, to use them. Secondly, it needs to be a safe area that's out of walkways. And there may be times, I mean, we may have to put some of our roofing materials for the sanctuary in the yarded area here. We'll try to make it look as good as we can and keep the area cleaned up, but there probably, you know, there'll be a, there'll be an amount of time, a few weeks where those materials will be seen. But again, they'll be in, in smaller portions. Okay. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. Any more questions on the roofing? Okay, good. Fire detection. So we're putting fire detection system um, in all the facilities and in the office as well. We have a fire detection system that's in the Barrett building. It was put in when it was built. I think it was really, I wasn't here then. I think it was put in to meet the uh, fire codes at the time. It just it has not been maintained. Uh, but our design did get completed. The fire marshal stamped the drawings, sent them back. Uh, and I have three companies giving me bids for those, and they are due in on March the 12th. The fire detection system in this facility, in these three buildings, will be a combination of wired and wireless. So that's going to minimize conduit and that ugly square plastic wire mode that everybody hates. Uh, so we we're, hopefully we'll have uh, almost none of that. Uh, because that's that's actually quite quite unsightly. Um, we will have a horn strobe system in here. There's two kinds of systems. You can do horn strobe, uh, or you can do voice commands and voice prompts. Uh, there are certain codes about when you have to have one or the other, and we fall un we fall under the uh, guidelines of horns and strobe, so we don't have to have the voice commands unless we need them. I think the, so the horns and strobes, uh, first of all, they're more cost efficient. Secondly, they help us too by not having to run um, <clears throat> wiring and conduit and wire mode to them uh, because horns and strobes will be wireless. Uh, so that will actually help, help in the installation. So that's what will be in this building. Uh, of course, there'll be pool stations throughout uh, and those, those are in the design and they meet the code about where they're supposed to be, how many they're supposed to be, their height off the floor. Uh, 
And so all those were approved by the fire marshal's office. Uh, and then there will also be a separate system, small system that's in the, that's in the church office. And then when we get that done, and I think I've already told everybody, when we get that installation complete, that will be a monitored system. Uh, now that ties us back into uh, to the presentation that was just made. I am, uh, I am going to be actively uh, talking to the company that's awarded the contract about what they have for uh, emergency notification outside of fire if one can be tied into that system. I'm not sure that it can. I'm investigating that. Uh, I will say that Parker has presented a couple scenarios uh, <clears throat> that are outside of the fire detection system, and let me let me tell you what those are right now because those are already in the works and hopefully will be in shortly. Uh, our nursery is pretty important to us, uh, and we want to put a notification system in there that a nursery worker can push a button and notify somebody during the service when there's kids in there. And we decided the best place for that notification to go is in the sound room. Because when there's kids in there, there's someone in the sound room. So we'll be getting that system in soon. Uh, and we're also going to put in a system uh, in the Wesley Preschool where, where if a situation happens and they need emergency response, they can push a button and it notifies someone over at the church office. Because when Wesley Preschool is going on, the, there's people in the office uh, working. <clears throat> so that will be happening very shortly. Any questions about the fire detection system? Okay, good. Flooring. Uh, flooring types are, are currently being finalized uh, and bids are being secured. It, remains unscheduled at this time. Uh, it's, it, it's a few months out yet anyways, but the trustees have, the trustees have been considering flooring types for the different locations. We're kind of rethinking maybe what we're going to do in the hallways, uh, not only to provide a more durable, longer lasting material, but, but something that's, that's also slip resistant and has low maintenance. Uh, so we're looking at that right now. And uh, yes, that's correct. So as you know, really all of our hallways currently have carpet in them. If you'll look in most of the hallways, you'll see that the, that the life cycle of that carpet was gone about 10 years ago. It's, they, it looks pretty bad, uh, and a lot of it's wearing. Uh, so we've gotten good life out of it, but it's just, it's, it's really hard to keep clean. So we've weighed options with carpet squares. Carpet squares are real nice because you can, if you destroy a two by two square, you can pull it up and put another one down. And there's still a problem with that because the one you put down is gonna be new. The ones that are there, they may be five or 10 years old and they may have some wear, some dirt, it may be faded from the sun, so you're still going to be able to tell a, di a difference in that. Uh, we are considering possibly putting carpet squares in the rooms, though. Uh, but in the hallways, uh, probably what we're going to put, and we haven't finalized this yet, but we're leaning toward it, and we're probably going to do it. It's, it's, it's called, uh, the acronym for it is LVT. It's Luxury Vinyl Tile. We'll be putting down a commercial product with a 20 year warranty. Now they make a residential product um, and it's real nice, but it's designed for very light traffic <clears throat> and it's not gonna hold up here. So we'll be putting a commercial grade, but they make every imaginable color and design. You can get them to look like wooden planks. You can get them to look like tiles. Uh, so we're finalizing those decisions right now, but I, that will be a very, durable, long-lasting product with low maintenance, and it will be extremely attractive, and I know everybody will be thrilled with it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Uh, yes, ma'am, we have actually already decided the banquet room will be getting the LVT in it. Yeah. All right. I got a couple fans down here. Can you clarify which entrance you're talking about? Oh, where the blue tile is right now. Yeah, so all so, Yeah, so all that so that's a carpeted hallway and that will be L V T. Uh, we haven't decided yet if we're keeping the tiles that are there uh, right now, because um, as we know, ceramic and porcelain tile is, is long lasting. So we might leave those uh, and just maintain rugs because we need a walk in area where because people are going to come in your your feet are dirty it's raining you're, you're muddy and dirty and we need an area uh, that you can walk in and kind of clean your feet before you get on to the to the other flooring even though the other flooring again is very durable and very easy to clean it's still it's still kind of standard protocol to put a walk-in area so we'll probably end up leaving those little tile areas or we might take those up if the colors don't match uh, with the color choices we might we might take those up but we'll have a walk-in area of, of, of some kind to maintain that no we did not get into the kitchen so that's a different conversation actually all the flooring in the building that's carpeted is getting replaced if we're going to get into the kitchen that's that expense goes up real quickly because you got a lot of stuff you got to move out and you got to decide what you're putting uh, and then once we open up that can of worms we got to talk about some of our uh, aging appliances and some of the infrastructure so that is not part of this project the uh, the uh, VCT that's in there is in pretty good shape and and it can always be stripped and waxed at any time and so we think it's, it's it's good for now. We're going to hold off on that until a later date. Any other questions about flooring? Okay, good. Uh, the facility painting, that's twice I've done that. The uh, facility uh, painting project, that will kind of be toward the last uh, or toward the tail end of the project. Uh, the flooring and the painting will both be uh, toward the end of the project it's it's unscheduled now but we've already secured our contractor we've secured our bid uh, and so we're just kind of waiting for some of the other work to get done uh, you know we don't want to start painting now we have a few water leaks here and there we want to make sure the roofing's done we want to make sure our uh, the, the the windows are in and all that so painting will be put into the project at its at its proper time and what we are going to do uh, is we're going to standardize on some colors throughout the facility. Um, I don't know how many colors yet, but they will be neutral colors. <clears throat> we'll be repainting the classrooms. The only area uh, that will get a uh, reprieve from that is the Wesley Preschool area. I know they've done some work to, and I know a lot of the classes have done some work to, to, to repaint their classes, and thank you for everybody. <clears throat> that has stepped up to the plate and uh, painted your classrooms, maybe helped paint some hallways. Uh, the Wesley Preschool is kind of exempt from that just because the colors that they need need to be more geared toward their programs. Uh, so the Wesley Preschool area will be a little different. The rest of the facility will be some standardized uh, neutral colors. Hello, David. <laughs> uh, we haven't we have not finalized those standard colors yet uh, we will likely uh, be employing the interior designers that were that we used on the bathrooms to kind of help us make the right decisions uh, for that so we haven't standardized on them yet um, but we will shortly 
Any questions about painting? Okay, good. Uh, and the last thing I have on my list for the facility uh, renewal plan update is the ceilings. Uh, we're putting new ceilings and lights in the, in the Barrett Building hallways and in this ramp building. So, you know, those tiles are old and tired. We'll be putting a ceiling tile that has a, it's called a revealed edge. So it's got a three-dimensional look. It kind of sticks down past the grid a little bit. You've probably seen it in modern buildings. It's very attractive. Uh, we'll be replacing the old fluorescent lights with uh, LED lighting. We're going to adjust the lumens a little bit so that we have plenty of lights, but we don't have too many, and that the ambiance is very nice and matches the facility very well. And everything will be the same color. Uh, so that's that's currently that's currently unscheduled. That can kind of happen anywhere in the process as we as we move along. But when we get done with uh, when we get done with everything, that will really be attractive when you're walking down to the Barrett Building because you'll see new flooring, new ceilings, and fresh paint. And it's just gonna it's really gonna make a difference in the facility. And there may be some other areas some other ceilings that we do as well so we've we've uh, secured some pricing for some other areas um, and so we got a placeholder for that but that's based on how much of the contingency in the project that we need to use so just for those of you that don't know contingency is just a pot of money that we have for unforeseen things that we may encounter along this project and you never know exactly what that's going to be. Uh, we have a good amount of contingency uh, and we've anticipated some of the things that we can't see that we just know are going to be there. Uh, but we're holding that pot of money. We'll spend it as we go along and if we see we might have a little left, we might do another ceiling or two in selected areas. But, uh, but no promises there on that. Any questions about the ceilings? Okay. Great. Well, thank you for letting me present that. So I have one more topic that I'd like to present uh, that the trustees have been looking at. And I think this next issue has, uh, I think it's been a concern of, of a lot of people in the church now for, for quite a few years. And it's, it's, it's been brought up at various times. Uh, I know the trustees have, have fielded uh, concerns, uh, some complaints, and, and just some ideas about maybe what we need to do with our facility. We have a nice facility here, um, and uh, we're, we're just not really sure that we're utilizing all the spaces in the most efficient manner. Uh, Jason is actually going to help me with this. Um, presentation here in just a minute so let me tell you what it is because I know you're asking I think some of you have probably already heard from selected members of the trustees uh, if you're in if if you're one of the selected classrooms you've probably kind of already heard what we're batting around we haven't finalized the plan yet so it hasn't been uh, voted upon and ratified uh, but we hope it will be very soon. So um, really what we're talking about is moving some of the classrooms around to more strategic, logical locations. For instance, we have um, an elderly class, Sunday school class that meets on the third floor and the attendance has been dropping now for quite some time because quite frankly, some of the folks just can't get up to their Sunday school class. Uh, so that's been a concern now uh, for a few years, and, and, it's, and it's not getting any better. Uh, and so they've approached us about moving to a location on the first floor so the folks can get in there uh, to Sunday school. Uh, I know that the, the, uh, the youth program, uh, they've, had, uh, they've had an area over in the Barrett building uh, it really doesn't meet their needs anymore. You know, the youth, the children of this church are the future of this church. 
And it's not that they're more important than any of the members here, no matter what your age, whether you're two, two months old or whether you're 92. You know, everybody here is, is just as important as anyone else. But if this church is to continue and survive as time moves on, we've got to have good programs for the kids and the youth. <clears throat> they have to make sense. Uh, they have to be relevant for the environment that we live in today. Um, and so, with all those things, that's number three. I'm keeping count. Uh, with all those things in mind, uh, we've batted around some ideas about what we might do. So, can everybody see this up on the screen? It's too far. It's, it's kind of small. Okay, so uh, I'll try to I'll try to tell you what we're looking at right now. Um, and Jason's going to help me with with the LED pointer. So we'll look on this side if you can see that. Or Jason, you might point to both sides once we once we uh, identify an area. So one thing that we're talking about is, I guess where we're going to start at is in, in the Barrett building. Thank you. That's, I think that's very helpful. Does that help? It helps me. Um, we're going to start in the Barrett building. SGC2. Can you point to that, Jason? So that's the old church office. Um, it, it's currently the kids' corner right now. Uh, that's where Jennifer's program is. Uh, and it's kind of, she doesn't really feel like it's, it's, it's a permanent place, but she's actually utilized the space uh, quite nicely. But one of the ideas that we have here is to actually take the youth area in SGCA, and Jason, you've, you've went over this plan with me, so if I say something wrong, would you please correct me? SGC 8 is currently the youth room. There's, there may have used to been a wall in there, I'm not sure, but there's two exterior doors to it. Uh, but it's one open area now, and, what, and what, we're, what we're considering doing is taking the SGC 2 area, taking down the walls, and moving the youth over to there. Part of that would be moving the class that's in SGC 4, and that's currently where the library is, uh, moving that class out of there, and I'm not sure the name of the class that's in there. New Beginnings. Uh, taking that class and giving them a portion of SGC 8. It would actually be the exact same size that you have right now. As a matter of fact, it would probably be a little bit bigger because the books would be gone, so you'd actually have a larger, a, a larger area. Again, that, that section already has two uh, doors that go out into the hallway. That would allow us to tear down this other wall between uh, the SGC2 area and the SGC4, and that whole area then could, could actually be the youth uh, the youth corner, if you will, the youth area. Well, we think that'd be a very good way to utilize the. That'd be a very good way to utilize the space. Isn't that also the well?
So we haven't decided where we're actually going to put the library right now. There's been some ideas. Uh, one idea is maybe move it over to the church office. Uh, we, we have not finalized on that yet. Okay, well, I... Yeah, well, and there may be another location that we can, that we can put it in, uh, in the building here. So we're not doing away with the library, uh, but we are looking for a new location to put it because, you know, it's important that the youth program has enough space to continue their programs and to actually grow the programs. Uh, and we got, and we can't put everybody in one class, so they do need the breakout room. So that really needs to be a part of their space. So again, we're, we're not going to get rid of the library. We are going to relocate it. We just really haven't decided where that's going yet. So those ideas are still being batted around. But thank you for that input. I appreciate that. It it, it may be that. Mm hmm. Sure. And well, that's that's one of the suggestions is that if we don't put it all, we can walk we gone through one side, I thought you the other side was very concerned. The other side we haven't gone through and we want to get it in. And so if we go through it and we decide that on the book is not relevant. Yeah, so all those are great ideas, and the and the trustees have been presented with cleaning up the inventory, uh, so we know that does need to happen. Yeah. Yeah, so I hear you. So I hear you. The library needs to be accessible. The library also needs to be relevant with relevant material, uh, material that, that, that people use or historical material that's of value. Uh, it shouldn't be a place where, you know, my mom dies and she had, uh, she had 30 books on re religion and I can't stand to part with them, but I don't want them in my house, so I bring them to the church and put them in the library. You know, that's not, that's not the right thing to do. So we've got to have some type of inventory control. Well, we sure appreciate that input. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and that's what this... That's part of what this is about. You know, we're getting ideas. Also, if you have an idea you can't think of tonight as part of this presentation and you want to contact a trustee, uh, we're more than happy to hear what you have to, have to say. Because, you know, we're also looking for unintended consequences. Uh, we think we've thought a lot of this out uh, and we have a lot of things in play, but we're relying on people in the congregation to maybe see something that we didn't see and, and to help us see that so we can consider that uh, as, we're, as we're developing a plan here. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's a great point. Thanks for bringing it up. I, I, I guess I should have prefaced the whole conversation with that. If we're going to make changes and tear out walls uh, and move uh, classrooms, we need to do it now before we paint and put down flooring because we don't want to have to come back and repaint or change the flooring and rip out what we just did. So strategically, as the pastor just stated, n now is the time to, to make these changes uh, before we do all that work. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, so let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, somebody has mentioned that we put up a, a partition of some kind so that we could open that up and use that as one big room. That's an excellent idea. But So the pros in that is that we could have one room if we needed it for whatever reason as opposed to two. Uh, one, of the, but one of the cons in that is a noise transmission. Now, if you go to a large convention center, you'll notice they have walls, and you can, and they take a big uh, convention center, and they move all these walls out, and they, and they segment the area so they can hold different breakout sessions, different rooms. I don't know if you've ever looked at any of those walls, but they're like four to six inches thick, and they have closed cell insulation in them and carpeted panels, and that is noise control for that. Those are very expensive, extremely expensive. If we just put up a partition here, like like a cubicle type partition you might see in an office, it's just, it's it's, it's going to transmit noise uh, pretty easily. And there's another class that's going on the other side of that. So depending on how rowdy the folks get, I don't know how rowdy you folks are in your class. Are you? I, th I thought so. Yes. Yeah, that's right. They are that they're they're tracked on the ceiling, so you roll them out. Uh, so so I hear you, and we're kind of batting that around right now. We don't know. We haven't we haven't came to a conclusion yet. Oh yeah 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 yeah. No, it's a good it, it's a good question, and it was a good suggestion. You know the 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 benefit of having one room is good, uh, but we're just not sure if the cost. Well, it will actually outweigh uh, having the one room. Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I appreciate that. I, it's, uh, uh, we, we were considering moving the classroom on the third floor. Is that, whose classroom is that? Can you tell me again? No. So you are, so you know, I walked by there, that classroom this morning, and I just glanced in there, and I said, wait a minute, that ain't the folks that usually meet in there. And I peeked in there, and I thought, and I thought, I wonder if they've already swapped. All right. That's how, that, that sounds like a win-win. Okay. Well, good. So the class that we were, there's two classes on the third floor that we were going to move. One of them is the class that I'm in. That's the Seekers. And, yeah, but you're Yeah. I, I'm younger, but I'm not getting any younger. Uh, and then the other class apparently has already moved, and so good. So thank you for being team players. We appreciate that. So with the younger folks, and what's the name of your class, Alex? Okay. With that class being up on the, uh, the third floor, that's actually where a lot of their children are going to be located. And so it's going to be good for them, and apparently they don't mind trekking the steps, and the folks have already moved, so that's good. That, that worked out very well. Thank you. Yes.
Yes. Yeah, so the new... On the first floor, I don't think we were proposing any changes. No changes on the first floor. Just third floor and Barrett building. So that's so that was our. So that's actually what we're considering. Well, actually, this. Yeah, actually, the Seekers class, and that's my class, and we're on the third floor also, we would be moving down to that other half of that cl classroom. Yes. We are very good neighbors. They do get rowdy in there, and I try to corral them, but I have no luck with that at all. <clears throat> oh, there's my wife. Hi, Tabitha. Um. Uh, Yes, sir. Is that the cl is that the class across from the banquet room that's in the corner of there? Okay. Are they asking? Are they asking for a table? Okay. Well, I mean, if they if they have a need for that and they make a request, we'll we'll be sure. Yeah, we can accommodate that. Yeah. Well, that room is not that, and and thank you for that. That room is not as big. You change. Oh. Uh, yeah. Can you go back to the basement, please, Janet? Thank you. That room is actually not as big uh, as, as the youth room. So if we subdivide that, then it's actually going to be too small for any useful purpose. Yeah, this is, just, this is not to scale, in case you're wondering. Uh, so it looks the same there. But. So there's I mean, the room, pretty much the same size on, on the same. But it also gives you a clock. And it does give us a clock in the next. Very important. And one door is going to get rid of that And we had initially, and, and the trustees had initially entertained an idea about moving the youth up to the third floor and giving them their own area and renovating it. First of all, that would be very costly. Second of all, that that that's really not the best for the program. You know, the youth are very important, and they, I think they would feel a little bit displaced. Jason's polled a lot of them, and they would just really feel displaced, and we want our youth to feel comfortable. We want them here. We want them to have a good program, and we want them to grow as well. So we also want to give the youth program that, that other breakout room where SGC4 is. Okay. Okay. Can you put
Yeah. So, 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 so did everybody hear that? Or do I need to reiterate that? Uh, part, part of strategically moving these classes off the third floor uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the things that we've already mentioned is we want to clear a space uh, for, the, uh, for the children's programs. And, uh, and Jennifer, has, Jennifer uh, has come on board. She's doing a great job. She has a lot of vision uh, for the children's ministry in this church, but she really don't have any space to, to, to make that vision come to life. And we want to provide that uh, for her and, and support that program. So as you see on the, as you see on that third floor, uh, we are actually earmarking a, a pretty good area for them uh, that's going to support support that program that Jennifer has uh, for the for the young children. Well, they're up there with their parents, um, so uh, I don't. I, I feel confident in saying that Jennifer monitors the children, uh, and so I don't think they're going to actually come and fall down the steps, and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't be negotiating the steps unless they were first of all old, old enough to do that successfully. You know, they will have restrooms up there as well, or they're with their parents, uh, or, or or they're with their Sunday school teacher. So, I so so we believe it's a safe area. Okay. Yeah, and so that was that was actually at, at some point before I was here, that was actually one room already. Those walls that are in there, they're not load bearing. They were built as partition walls to support whatever uh, programs were important at the time that that was done. Those can come out fair, fairly easy though. Uh, yes, Parker. So that's, so that's a very good point. Did everybody hear that? Uh, right, of course, right now, you know, the, the, the kids are, are down there in the, in the old office area where we're proposing putting the youth. Uh, and, and the security folks has identified that as a snatch and grab area. Uh, so they feel like the kids will actually be more secure on the third floor. They're the farthest from any of the entrances. They're close to their parents. Uh, so that's a benefit as well. Have I sufficiently covered all the uh, areas? Does anybody, can anybody think of anything I've left out here? Pardon? Oh, the two. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if I, I thought I'd already shared that with Lisa. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about in the uh, basement area. You had requested... Uh, the use of that room in the corner. Uh, <clears throat> and you had mentioned to me you're using it as, as offices now and there's not enough heat in there. Uh, we're, and and we're, we're looking for another place to put the scouts, to relocate the scouts to actually enlarge your area so you could expand your, your programs. Uh, so we, so we, we are strategically and diplomatically Trying to make that happen as part of this part of this process. You know, a lot of people have had these spaces uh, in areas for a long time, and they, they feel a sense of ownership uh, with these with these areas. And I and I understand that. So we want to be sensitive to to people's concerns and needs that they may have. Does anybody else have any more comments or questions concerning that plan?
Yeah. Okay, any other? Yes, Parker. Yeah, so right now, I, I mentioned earlier, the trustees are trying to figure out how we're going, going to accommodate handicap accessibility to the first floor, to the restrooms. Uh, and, in, and in all likelihood, uh, we'll be putting some type of lift in that area. So, and that may, and, and this, and all we're doing right now is batting ideas around. So there's, there's nothing written in stone. We're just trying to see what's feasible and what, what, what maybe we can and can't do. But we're talking about extending this area out a little bit, making it part of the building, moving these double doors out, and then utilizing that area then that we enclose to put the lift to take us up to the first floor and if we do that then we'll have to open that that little small little room up to be used for that fashion and again that's not no, there's been no decisions uh, made about that yet but that but that is on the table I'm un no, no, I'm unfamiliar with the cameras. I know about the doors being locked. So would you like to talk about it, or Parker? One of the things we discussed was adding a few cameras downstairs to the Wesley Preschool that also tied into the office area. You know, we, we talked about, you know, of course, right now, trying to ring people in and out of the doors so that they're there and, and just so that if somebody's at that door, potentially having a view so that if Lisa's downstairs and somebody's at the door, she knows who's there before she walks out and looks out the door. You know, it's a problem that you did, but I guess it fell off my plate, so. That was kind of the idea, was that there be a camera on that door that was locked whenever somebody does it. So,
No, that's okay. I'm glad you did bring it up. I, I'm, that, that totally fell off my plate. I hate to say this with my wife back there, but I'm not a perfect man. Uh, so it sounds like I need to touch base with Parker and or Pastor next week. I need to get that back on my plate so we can get that, get that done. So I'll give one of you guys a call next week and we'll get that, get that back on the table. Anything else? Any other comments? I know we've went long. Thank you for your patience. I hope all the information was helpful. I'd like to thank everybody for their comments, uh, questions. If you think of anything else, please contact a trustee. We do want to hear your ideas. Um, last call for questions and comments. Okay. Good. Thank you. I want to make sure I didn't miss one comment. Uh, the project manager is uh, uh, Jason Hamilton. He's a local project manager. He actually his his day job is at the University of the South. Jason's got about 17 years of experience. Uh, he also has a side consulting job, so we've hired him to help out with that process. All right, let us pray. Lord God, we just come before you this evening just humbled by your grace and by your love. God, we ask that you be with the Trail family and the loss of their loved ones. Be with Gary and Terry and, and Karen and Brent and the rest of their family as they deal with this loss of a dear loved one. And God, use us to be instruments of your love in this world as we look to make this, this church facility a beacon of hope in this community but also a, a fortress of solitude where we can come and, and feel safe and we can worship you freely. Let us be ever vigilant in that process and take the steps needed to do so. God, it is exciting for us to come together as a congregation and, and dream and plan for the future and know the great things that we can do in this place through the gifts that you have given us of this awesome facility. As we rebuild your temple here in, in Franklin County, help us to rebuild your kingdom in our hearts as well. We pray.